Hello, everyone. Welcome to our TI Tech Day session on integrated USB connectivity with MSP430 MCUs. On today's agenda, we have MSP430's USB module. This section talks briefly about USB features and describes details on the architecture. In the second session, we have MSP430 devices with USB. This is an introduction to our USB roadmap and the MSP430 portfolio on which devices will have USB and when they will be sampled or released to the market. Our third section talks about MSP430's USB support. This session details the TI provided USB support software for easy USB development. USB module features and architecture. Universal Serial Bus has been in the market for quite some time now. It's a time-tested and popular connectivity solution that has been around and gained popularity in the last decade. Today we can see USB in everything from cell phones to iPods to coffee bombers, and it's become almost a standard user experience, and manufacturers see it as a simple yet essential part of their application. USB being a mature technology, on the surface it's very easy to use and this is one of the main reasons why it's so popular. But underneath the hood, um, there is a lot of complexity in terms of developing a USB solution from an embedded developer's perspective. The next slide talks a little about popular USB terms, just to get you introduced to the terms that we'll be seeing throughout this presentation, um, as well as just terms you should know when you start developing with the USB protocol. So USB host. USB itself is a host control protocol. There's always only one host per bus at any given time. And it's, it's a master-slave kind of topology with a single master or host and multiple slaves or devices. A single USB host can support up to one, 127 devices. USB descriptors. USB descriptors are files that give the host information about the USB device, such as the USB version that it supports, the product ID and vendor ID, and so on. The vendor ID is an ID supplied by the vendor to identify the device. For an example, uh, a VID in an Apple device would show up as the word Apple, and a product ID would show up as the product line in that manufacturer. So your Apple Nano would have a VID of Apple and the PID of Nano. Enumeration is a process of obtaining descriptors to determine which device is connected to the bus and the drivers associated with its device class. So when the host sees or enumerates a device, it's able to figure out what is the device class that it needs to use to talk to, to this device. We'll talk a little more about device classes later on, but I just wanted to give an overview idea of what a device class means. A device class is a protocol or a particular a particular kind that, that is assigned to a particular kind of device, and we're familiar with these terms such as mass storage or human interface or CDC device class. Uh, mostly we, we see where this is being used. For example, a HID device class is used in plug-and-play devices like mice and keyboard, where no installation is needed. A mass storage device class is used in flash drives where bulk amounts of data need to be transferred between a host and a device. So these are some of the USB terms that I'll be using in this session and also it's good to know about just to understand kind of the basics of USB. Okay, MSB430 USB system. To meet the needs of an embedded market while providing an easy connectivity solution, 430 has introduced its first integrated USB SOC product, the MSP430 F5529. Now, the USB integration, when you, when you combine it with what we have to offer in the 5XX family, which is um, highly integrated analog, intelligent peripherals, a CPU that's capable of powerful performance up to 25 megahertz, it gives you an integrated and ideal solution that provides a complete embedded application. And part of the value add of having a 430 integrated USB SOC is the fact that TI provides the MSP430 USB API stacks. Now, these stacks reduce the development time greatly 
for the embedded developer and it gives them an opportunity to test and start out development with the MSP430 USB system without investing too much effort. To talk about the MSP430 bus speed, USB uh, 1.1 supported two bus speeds, the, the low speed and the full speed. The low speed was popular before when used for mice um, and other such devices. It's not used that commonly anymore. Now full speed is one of the most popular bus speeds in, in the USB uh, spec. And high speed devices are are not as common because of their high bit rate at 480 Mbit per second. So for the 430, the full speed is kind of it's it's a perfect place in terms of speed requirements because we're talking about a 25 megahertz processor. So it makes sense that we will support a, a 12 Mbit per second USB spec. Now the what are what are kind of the applications where MSP 430's um, full speed device can be used? You you can think of any embedded application that needs to download uh, information from a host or upload data to a host. For example, you could have a handheld meter that does data logging or has data logging capabilities, and you could use this handheld meter to upload information to the host via USB. You can also think of a simple USB meter that plugs into um, another host, such as a printer, that lets you print out any kind of information or uh, details from the MSP430 device. Moving on to transfer types and endpoints. From this point on, the session gets a little more detailed about what USB um, is and kind of the key terminology and the key um, configuration um, ideas that you have to get used to when developing with USB. So for someone who's new to USB, the term transfer types and endpoints could be, um, be you know, it could be a brand new term, but just to make it in, put it in simple terms, um, an endpoint is described as a source or sink of the data. So basically it can be a source of information or a conduit through which data is transferred. Now a transfer type, there's, there's four transfer types in USB. So we have control, interrupt, bulk, and isochronous. Control is typically used when you need status or command operations, when you need to move around status or command operations. The interrupt transfer type is used for periodic and usually device-initiated communication. Bulk data type is, as its name uh, implies, is used for large and kind of bursty data transfers across the line. Isochronous is typically used in high-speed streaming audio and video, so the 430 doesn't support it. Now, in terms of endpoints, um, these you can think of these as um, a, lo a logical pipe that connects between the device and the host, and typically the number of endpoints determine how many logical devices can be present inside a physical device. For example, the 430 that has eight input and eight output endpoints can be configured as two different CDC devices. Each CDC device or communications device class device requires three, uh, three endpoints. So in these eight, eight endpoints, you can make a configuration um, into a number of logical USB device inside the one physical device. So eight endpoints and eight outpoints are available on the 430, and this is usually sufficient for most mainstream MSP430 applications. USB power system. Now, regardless of um, the kind of microcontroller you're using or what kind of USB application you have, most handheld or battery-powered applications, power is a critical design constraint. It, and in terms of USB, even if it's a plugged-in USB device, you want to always think about how much power is being consumed. Now, the 430, in, as a part of its USB solution, offers an integrated LDO which means you can have the option of powering off, powering the 430 off the 5-volt bus. Now, there are three possible ways you can power an MSP430 USB device. One is bus-powered, which is completely supplying power from VBus and powering down the device when VBus is not present. Two is self-powered, which is completely supplying the power from a battery uh, regardless of whether or not VBus is present. And three is switch context powering. Now, this is the most popular 
configuration for power, wherein your 430 is able to detect whether VBUS is present or not and uses that to decide to switch between VBUS and a self-powered system. It makes sense that the device is able to detect this because if when VBUS is absent, the 430 can power down and switch off non-critical tasks and thus achieve a low power consumption. Ideally, battery-powered devices can maximize operating life by powering the device over the bus whenever VBUS is present. So you want to have a situation where your application is constantly powered off VBUS, but once VBUS is switched off, you want it to be able to context switch onto a self-powered system. Clocking. In terms of clocking, um, the 430 solution provides an integrated PLL. So the idea behind providing a PLL is that we, we needed a low jitter, high accuracy clock for the USB to function. Now, you can always, you can use a high frequency crystal anywhere between um, 1.5 of 4 megahertz and 32 megahertz for this PLL. Or you can also get, if another clock is already available on your system, you can use that clock and just provide additional input um, to the HF crystal. So you can do one or the other. You can use a HF crystal or just a digital input. Now, the integrated PLL takes this crystal frequency and it revs it up to the required 48 megahertz for the USB protocol. One of the reasons why we need um, a high-frequency crystal and not use the integrated DCO is because we need to be able to provide um, an extremely high accurate clock for USB operation. Now, the PLL, of course, is configured such that in, in suspend mode, um, the US, when the USB is in suspend mode, it's powered down and reactivated when resumed. This is just to make sure that we keep inside the power consumption limits when we are in suspend mode. So if you're looking to clock your USB system, you can either use a HF crystal, and this can be just any frequency. For example, if you had an RF crystal already on your system, you can use that, um, a 6 megahertz or an 8 megahertz, or you could just pick the cheapest crystal you can find on the market, or if you have uh, an externally available clock source from anywhere else in the system, you can put the 430 clock in bypass mode and just take in a digital input. So this slide talks a little bit about how the USB controller um, transfers data packets from the USB host to the USB buffers. So a good thing to know is that uh, there is a dedicated 2 kilobyte RAM space for the USB. And now when the USB is disabled, this RAM space can be taken up by the user um, and for the application if required. Now, whenever the USB is enabled, um, as I mentioned before, we have eight endpoints. Now, endpoint zero is always considered the default endpoint, and this has a dedicated buffer space, so it's not configurable. But the rest of the endpoints from one to seven have a configurable buffer space. And what that means is that each of these kind of communication channels has a buffer space associated with it. So you can think of these pipes um, and how they act as communication channels, and each of them end in a buffer space. Now, the size of, of this buffer is completely configurable by the user. You can have up to 64 bytes. And the other thing to know about the buffers is that it's double buffered. What that means is that you have X and Y buffers, meaning when one is being filled up, the other can be read out. So you don't have to have the lag time wherein you have to read one out before you refill it again. This, of course, is going to greatly increase the throughput of your USB system. The other thing to know about the way the data transfer takes place is that the user is allowed to configure whether the CPU does the transfers or the DMA. If you chose to reduce the load on the CPU, you can configure the 430 such that the DMA completely takes care of the data in and the data out of the buffer, and it does it automatically uh, for you. So you don't. There's no kind of user interference. There's no need to service interrupts or service interrupt flags. So the last few slides talked a little about the USB solution that we have to offer and kind of deep dive into the 430's USB offering. We covered um, the USB transfer types and endpoints, the power system, uh, the clocking, 
and memory and data transfer. This block diagram slide kind of brings it all together and gives a high-level overview um, or a peek under the hood of the USB engine. So you can see on the left, um, there are two LDOs. One is the 3.3-volt LDO, which is used to convert the VBUS, the 5-volt VBUS, to an acceptable 3.3 volt for the MSP430. And then we also have the integrated 1.8 volt LDO. This is um, this LDO is a part of every 5XX family, and this supplies the uh, digital core with 1.8 volts that it needs. The portion, the rest of the portion in gray um, also contains, of course, the USB transceiver that's integrated, um, and what we call the USB engine. Now, the USB engine is what manages the USB protocol requirements for for the data packets that are being received and transmitted on the bus. So you can see that it serves as an interface between the USB RAM, which is where the data is either stored or read out of, and the transceiver, which is your basically your file layer um, or the physical layer that sends these bits out on the USB bus. On the right-hand side, you can see the rest of the 430 architecture in terms of CPU, DMA, and how they all interact with the USB modules, and of course, um, the peripherals and the, the RAM and the clocking system. The next section talks a little more about um, the roadmap we have for MSP430 devices with the USB module. Now, the USB module was first introduced in the 5XX family for the MSP430 5529 device, but moving forward, we will be integrating more devices with this module. You can see that from the slide that it's, it, it is going to be a big feature in our 5 and 6XX family. The slide kind of talks about the key uh, features or the important features in the 5XX and what's new about it. Um, a few attractive features you want to look at, one is, of course, that 1.8 to 3.6 volt operation, which can now move up to 25 megahertz of CPU speed. Uh, we are also able to do in-system programming over the entire voltage range of the device. Apart from this, we have uh, a number of new per we have a number of new modules and a lot of advancements to existing peripherals. There is also complete flexibility in our clock system, and we have integrated. Um, there is a highly integrated programmable power supervision in terms of our supply voltage supervisor or SVS module. Now, there are three new families in the 5XX, 6XX range that are going to integrate USB. One of them is the 5.5.2X. Um, this, is the, this is the first USB integrated SOC solution. The second is going to be the 5.6X or the 6.6X family. The 6.6X is basically... Um, USB integrated solution with LCD as well. And then there's also going to be the Tiny or the 550X device, which will be sampling next year. The following slides talk a little, get a little more into detail about what each of these families uh, constitute. So the 552X device is, is, is the flagship USB device, um, or, or the first uh, 430 with the uh, USB integrated in it. Um, it. It's referred to as a mid-range device because we're looking at about 128K of flash with 8K RAM, so kind of fits right into those mid-range applications. If, if you look closer at the block diagram, you'll see a few new modules. Um, if you're familiar with previous 430s in the 4XX and the 2XX family, you'll see that in the 5XX, we have a new power management module, a SIS module, and, of course, in the 552X, the full-speed USB that's integrated. Also, another new module that's on the 552X is the Comparator B. Um, I won't go into great detail about the features of Comparator B, but I will mention that the enhancements to Comparator B has been made um, to make it more suitable to capacitive touch sense applications. We also have um, the uh, USCI, two USCI ports, which provide UART, um, SPI, and I2C communication, uh, a number of timers, and the ADC-12A. So the ADC-12A is similar to the ADC-12 on previous, for, uh, on previous 430 devices with, uh, uh, with enhancements in the form of the reference module and reduced settling time and extremely low power consumption. Moving on to the next product family, the F563X, 
at 660X. Now, the 660X is basically the 560X with the LCD controller. So these are are, are your high-end devices. We're talking about 100-pin devices with 256K flash and 16K RAM. So these are your typical large memory devices. The 660X is also the flagship part in the 6XX family, and um, it integrates, of course, full-speed USB, but it also has um, a number of attractive modules, such as the EDI, which is our Enhanced Data Integrity Module, um, the RTC with the backup battery. So in, in this device, the RTC is able to function off of um, a battery backup supply. It also integrates the Comparator B, with enhancements to the DAC-12, the ADC-12, and a host of the timers. The next product of line is the F550X product line, and this is kind of what we call the tiny USB. It fits very well in the uh, small or the low-range, um, low-end embedded applications. So we're talking about applications with 32 kilobytes of flash and up to 4 kilobytes of RAM. So again, this is this is a classic 5XX part with you know comparator B, um, the power management, the sys module, the timers, and everything else you would see on a 5XX part. Um, it also integrates uh, the low-cost, efficient ADC10A, which is our enhanced ADC10 module. Of course, extremely low power um, and extremely efficient ADC10 module. Okay. This slide is kind of a derivative summary of all the devices that I talked about in the previous slides. So we have just uh, from the families, we have a 550, 551, 552, and in, this, in, in the high end, we have the 56X and the 66X families. And you can kind of look at um, the commonalities. So you have uh, four 16-bit timers in all of them. We also have... Um, uh, 32-bit multipliers in all of them. Um, the change, the main differences between these are in terms of flash space, where the 66X is the high end with the 256K, and all the way down to the 550, which is between 8 and 32K. So the last section kind of gave us uh, the last session gave us an overview of the roadmap of MSP430 parts in the USB product line. Um, and we have basically what we're trying to do is meet all ends of the spectrum. So we want to be able to um, target the low end, the mid range, and the high end devices and provide USB connectivity to all these embedded spaces. So this section talks um, uh, more about the support collateral and kind of the approach towards USB development with the 430. For anyone starting out with USB development, um, it can be a little daunting. If you want to take down the USB spec, it's about 800 pages long, and there's a lot of information you need to go through before you understand what the protocol means, how it's to be implemented, and uh, what kind of the different device classes are, how they differ in principle, and how you can implement them. Now, it, it can be really daunting if you want to start from scratch, but if you don't, then um, TI provides an incredibly advanced tool suite in terms of the USB API stacks. So you want to make sure that some of the challenges of, of developing on USB are listed on the slide, um, just complexity, and then you know you want to be able to deal with any kind of USB host and, of course, deal with um, situations on the USB bus wherein you, you might be, uh, the connection could be terminated and you have to respond to kind of these challenges. If you have, um, if you're able to get a jump start on this development, it is going to speed your overall system development greatly uh, to get jump started on USB development. And then it, it's going to get you in time to market um, just at a much faster and a more efficient way. So the idea is that um, you learn kind of how to use the USB tool suite and modify it to your application without having to go into all the nuts and bolts of the protocol and how it works and uh, trying to understand how you need to modify the hardware to meet your requirements. 
So the first uh, support collateral or, or effort from uh, 430 is the 430 USB API stacks. Now, as I mentioned um, before, we support for now three API stacks. One is the CDC or the communications device class and the HID or the human interface device class. And the third one is the MSC or the mass storage device class. Now, all, all these three device classes come with their own API stacks. Uh, we also provide code examples on how to access the functions within these API stacks and user guides for each of the API stacks uh, kind of telling you what the key features are, um, what the key, the key functionality is, and, and how to use it. Now, these stacks are available on, on TI Web. You should be able to get it when you sample your 430, and definitely this is something that's intended to be um, easy to kind of, it should be drop and compatible with your application. So these stacks are something you can just unzip and drop in your application, and you should immediately be able to play and get a feel of how USB works with the 430. Of course, uh, the stacks are also highly modular um, in that if you wanted to modify the stacks in any way, there is good documentation. You should be able to do this um, easily enough uh, to kind of suit the purposes of your application. The CDC and the HID APS stacks are available today. The MSC APS stack is currently still in development, and it's expected to be available in the first quarter of 2010. Another uh, support collateral that we offer um, is the MSP430 USB descriptor tool. Um, I did make a brief mention about what U USB descriptors are. So as a protocol, USB has a high descriptors, um, a, a number of descriptors such as the device descriptor, the interface descriptor, and so on. And you can think of these as kind of uh, labels or tags that your device needs to have in order for the host to be able to identify it. So device descriptors, in other words, they represent how the host views the device. And it contains most of the basic but really important information about the device, such as what is the USB version supported, um, what is the vid and the PID of the device, and so on. Now, in, in many cases, the developing the USB descriptors is probably the first step towards USB development. And by providing an easy-to-use graphical user interface to, uh, conf to configure and generate these descriptors, um, that helps you in simplifying the USB design process. So the graphical user interface um, provided by TI, this is available online today on the web, what it does is it gets in data from, from the user so you can feed in a VID, a PID, and some other configuration information, and you just have to click the Generate button, and this is going to automatically generate a descriptors.c and .h file that you can save that the API stacks use, um, and that they report and they use that to report to the host. So what we do is provide. This is a Windows graphical user interface utility. Um, if you want, you can develop your own utility based on um, on the one that TI provides. And just mainly the intent behind providing this is to simplify USB development and kind of get you jump started um, and get you ahead and get past the first step, which is getting the descriptors done. Now, another really popular USB tool is the USB field firmware updater tool. So for those of you already familiar with the 430, um, we have a number of field programming tools, such as the USB FET. We also have the GANG programmer. But of course, all of this means you have to have extra hardware to program the 430. Now, at a production level, this is probably acceptable. But when you go out in the field, it's going to be so much more convenient if all you need is your PC and a USB cable, um, and that's going to let you update the firmware on your 430. So, you know, your handheld meters, uh, your data logger device, whatever it might be, um, the field firmware engineer goes out there in the field and he has a graphical u user interface and all he needs to do is plug in the USB cable and click go and the USB interface automatically updates the firmware on the MSP430. 
So how it's able to do this is using the 430 BSL or the bootstrap loader, which is now capable of a USB interface. So previously, the 430 BSL communicated via UART. So it had an RXDX, and you communicated via UART or um, the PC from RS232 to UART. Now, with the 552X and other USB families from this point on, uh, they will have an integrated USB BSL that's based on the HID device class. What this means is that when you're using the 430's USB BSL, no installations are needed on the PC side. So it's it's pretty much plug and play. So once the 430 is in BSL mode, um, you plug in your USB cable and it's ready to download new firmware. Now, we also provide the uh, Visual Studio environment to create this graphical user interface. So basically, um, if you if you wanted to customize the look and feel and kind of brand this graphical user interface before you deploy it out in the field, you can do so. We provide the source for it. Um, so you can build up your own GUI and then use that um, to deploy your firmware upgrades to the field. So the graphic kind of shows you where this tool will be applicable. For example, you could have a firmware update. You could either um, download the graphical user interface. Your customer could download it onto his computer um, along with a new image of the firmware, and they can actually update the 430 themselves. Or you can supply the graphical user interface on uh, a CD-ROM along with the firmware image, uh, Again, customer can do this itself, or it can be, um, you know, a meter or anything else out there in the field that you send somebody out there, and it's fairly simple to use the USB to do this firmware upgrade. So we talked mostly about uh, the three tools that TI provides to simplify USB development and to get you started. Uh, the main, of course, the main support collateral is the API stacks. Um, the TI provided API stacks for HID, CDC, and MSE class. Uh, we also provide the device descriptor tool, which is a graphical user interface that that is a one-step uh, process towards creating descriptors uh, for your USB device. And the third tool is the USB field firmware upgrade tool, which can be used after your product is deployed in the field um, and can be used either by customers or field firmware engineers for an easy, simple method to upgrade the firmware. Now, moving on to a little more on the collateral, um, of course, with the 5529 uh, sampling kit, it's sampling right now. Today, you can go get yourself a sampling kit, and the, what you'll find in that kit is uh, device documentation. You will have the updated errata, the data sheet for the device, um, the user's guide, the USB module user's guide, and also since this device hasn't been released to market yet, uh, your IDE will need special patches for IAR and Code Composer that you can download. Um, you can download all this from our website today. So if you go to 430.com and you search for MSP430F5529, you can get to the product page and all this information that I talked about is there in that product page today. You can get the stacks, the device descriptor tool, the field firmware tool, and just all of the information listed on the slide. So this is a, a, a summary slide of uh, everything I talked about just before. With what, what you're getting with the sample kit um, and a getting started user's guide as well, and uh, just why you would need to use kind of the descriptor tool, the field firmware tool, and the CDC HID API stacks. So that covers our session on integrated USB connectivity with MSP430 MCUs. Um, I will now leave the floor open for questions if anybody has them. Thank you.